called my talk Coming to Grips with Future Time, although it's about many other things, it's also going to challenge you somewhat, I think. But I want to thank three people. First off, Ken has been the most proactive visiting visitor that, to any institution or unit, academic unit that I've been part of in a fairly long career. He, he came here and he came here to shake things up, not just to do his own work, not to chat with us, but to give us stuff. Steve, who has created this incredible multidisciplinary environment at Princeton, welcoming in all directions. I'm the only professor whose first office is in the PEI space, and I am as much, more, probably more than anyone, the beneficiary of this extraordinary set of people who, who come here because of the vision of PEI that Steve and also Kathy uh, empower every day. And then Tom. No, I think I knew you as an undergraduate. I certainly knew you very soon after, if not then. I've also read your works, and you're an inspiration to us all. And without your interest in where we're going, we wouldn't have had this conference or so many of those wonderful visitors that I've been talking with over the years. This is an advertisement for tomorrow. Um, I, right after lunch, you will meet a group of graduate students who are in an institution that I'm very very proud to have helped form back about five years ago. Uh, they are graduate students. And the way I think about it, there's one or two in each department who really care about these issues and it's lonely. But if they can be brought together, by the way, their numbers are actually growing in real time in the last few years, but there have been in the past just a few who weren't in graduate school in a careerist mode or under the thumb of a professor so much that they couldn't allow themselves the time to join a group with like-minded people, and they embody some of the spirit of this conference and of PI, and they're flourishing, and they're going to talk to you. And their main message that they, they're sharing with you is, we are bereft of humanists. If you look at that list of departments, they're not any there. And they are, we are going to work hard this term, this very month, in a recruitment letter that is out to all the graduate students on the campus and the faculty who have some say in this kind of thing or some influence in this kind of thing. But I'm not very optimistic, frankly, that we will get a very large, more than one or two human, humanities applicants because the work you've set yourselves to do here isn't very far along. And, the, um, and I, let me make a distinction, but two, two versions of what this conference is about. Environmental humanities is, is emerging. It is strong and it is programmatic, but it is a zing on, uh, a ding on zig. You're talking to yourselves primarily, you're inspiring yourselves primarily. The message of my talk and of this presentation by the graduate students is spend time with us. Us is the environmental science and technology community. In addition to what you're doing, because we need you, and because you need us. Because we will tell you things that we are worrying about, that we can't do without you, but that when you go away, you can do brilliant things with, which will feel good to yourselves and help us all. So that's my advertisement, that's where this talk is going. This talk is about the collaborative mode for the environmental humanities. And I'm gonna start with images, and they come from my teaching and lecturing. I spent time pouring over past talks saying which ones of these are going to make the points I want to make here, just a few. Um, and my world is actually not climate science for the most part. And there's a sli it's slightly wrong the way uh, my title works, in the t in the, in the, uh, which I think uh, Ken made up for me, the, the perspective from the environmental sciences. My world is more the solutions given the, given the climate science posed problem. Where the climate scientists discovered Earth's vulnerability, and that it was greater than we imagined and more, and coming faster than we imagined. And then there, are, there is an activity all over the world of, of figuring out what we do. And one of the, I have for some reason a dark side, and I see solutions, and I see what's wrong with them. I worry about what's wrong with them. So my world is the world of fraught solutions to climate science problems. And um, everybody likes to show a cartoon in their, 
in their talks. And this one is to be looked at for a moment. This one is loaded. It's got, you can deconstruct this slide in many ways. One first question is, what, is it funny? If it's funny, why is it funny? Um, there's something pathetic. On the other hand, there's something perhaps uh, far-seeing uh, in this picture. There's something about authenticity. There's something about second best. There's something about the good life is a life of maximal self-expression, which comes from a particular tradition, humanist tradition. I guess it's, it can be traced back to romanticism. That is being challenged by this picture. And as Mary and John were, Mary Evelyn and John were saying, there are other traditions, Buddhism among them, for which this wouldn't be funny at all, if I'm not mistaken. So I think this, this, this is an example of the kind, so the, in the IT, the world, the world of information technology can say, well, can travel videos be so good that people will prefer them to the actual visit to, say, the pyramids? Crowded, smelly, but maybe that's the whole point. So we have to unpack things like this because the way in which we are if we find this exclusively funny, we're in trouble. It's a rather complicated story here. Then I like this as a Rorschach test. What do you see when you look at that picture? Uh, I draw my students out. We build a list. So build a list. What do you see? Blood vessels. What? Blood vessels. You see blood vessels. Very good. You see it immediately as metaphor. What do you see else? Who else sees things? Huh? Disease. You see disease. Interesting. Okay. Crowding. Crowding. Mm -hmm. Connected. Connectedness. Complexity. Okay. Here are some other words on my list. I have a couple of the ones you've just said. Achievement. Social organization. We seem unable to do that today. We probably couldn't do that today. We did it in the past 50 years, but we can't do the same thing for electric, electric grids at the present time, which are needed for, for example, the solar future. I see mobility, uh, pollution, sprawl was sort of the crowdedness, hollowing out of cities, oil, and carbon dioxide. And you probably could add to the list. But here's an image which is playing at so many levels, and that's ambiguity, complexity. That's what the humanities can bring to the classroom and to the collaborative work. That's another one, much less familiar. A point by showing you two is maps, or form of art, that can carry so many messages. That story lets people zoop, people immediately go to where they live and they find the geysers of geothermal plant in California or the hydro plants of northwestern U.S., which, has, which is qualitatively different some, from the energy problems of power plant problems of other parts of the world. I talk about the go game in that the yellow is nuclear and the red is coal, and in the Appalachians, the red has captured the Appalachians and there's no territory for the nuclear folk to move into. They have to stay at the periphery. And there's this competition. Anyway, story after story. Then we go to a picture which I put the word context into the caption of this of today. And the very first talk talked about context. Ken's talk, I think, was you brought out context, if I remember right. Um, and uh, three very different versions of the same technology. The first one has an appeal to architecture. And by the way, uh, we've had a conversation, Mario and I, that architecture was missing from this whole meeting. Architecture maybe is a field which particularly exemplifies the collaboration of technology and the, and the arts. So there's a picture of, which involves building systems integration on the one hand, but it also is a conversation between the individual and the rest of us as to whether that, whether that homeowner is 
contributing to the solution of a, of a community problem or is actually trying to exile himself, self-exiled, or Tarki, and go it alone, Montana, rifleman style. There's both of those messages in that kind of solution. The upper right is, is the, reminds us of the poverty and the transition out of poverty that that very same technology may make possible. And the lower one reminds us that at the scale in which we are functioning on the planet, we will have to cover millions of square miles with stuff like this um, to, for example, forego coal. And marching over all kinds of places and transforming them. I, made, I intervened this morning to correct Ken when he told you that I had brought Edward Albee to campus when I had brought Edward Abbey to campus. And Edward Abbey is the author of a book that had a major influence on me as I got into this field, Desert Solitaire. He had not yet, writ, not yet written Monkey Wrench Gang when he came here. Um, Desert Solitaire needs to be read many times because the deserts that Abbey loves are the primary uh, targets for deployment of this stuff. And he will remind us that something very important will be lost. Land use change is in that bottom picture. Land use change is the technical phrase of the climate community. Really, really um, uh, a lot of expurgation in there. This is about changed livelihoods, displacements, uh, many effects on humans that are wished away in, in the current word, land use change, luck, is what the environmental literature calls all that stuff. Nuclear power, um, that's Fukushima on the left, and the one graph I left in on the right, many of my, much, much of my teaching will have pictures like the one on the right in them, uh, you can't turn, you turn, you close down a nuclear power plant because there are isotopes that got made in the fissions and there are no more fissions, but the isotopes are still decaying. This is, a fern, this is a fire you can't put out. You have to keep the hose on it for years and years and Fukushima lost the hose and there was a lot of radiation spread around. The next stage of that story to me is a wonderful book by Spencer Weart, uh, W-E-A-R-T, called Nuclear Fear where he talks about the first discoveries of nuclear radiation around the turn of the 19th to 20th century. You can see your bones of the hand, um, and it became very, and, and very quickly became, became associated with Frankenstein long before the nuclear bomb. And the question that is, was, is being argued out in Japan today, in some sense, is, is dread legitimate? If this is spooky and far more worrisome than the calculations of your actual probable risks of various kinds of cancers would ought to lead you to feel. And this has to do with evacuating cities and confiscating food and allowing people to reoccupy buildings and so on and so forth. How does the irrational figure in the, in the evaluation of policy? I sometimes call it the dread to risk ratio. The risk is what the calculations do, which are based on health data. The dread is the way people behave. Is dread legitimate? Um, this is an image which I thought I'd just discuss as an image. It's in a Scientific American article I wrote in 2005, and, but it's a community product because that was the time in which the idea of putting carbon dioxide below ground that was made in fossil fuel by fossil fuel power plants was kind of unfamiliar. And a lot of people working in that field felt they had a stake in the article that I was privileged to write. And this was the core drawing. And how would it, what would it look and how would it be shown? Obviously, a very skilled uh, illustrator uh, did the job, but there's, it was a, a kind of a group comp contribution from the community. Uh, the question there was, if no one had drawn to scale, what would happen if you ran a coal power plant for a certain number of years and had a certain volume of carbon dioxide that you didn't want to send to the atmosphere? How big would it be below ground, those lily pads of carbon dioxide? How big would they be? And it depends on quite a few assumptions. 
In the context of, of, of the humanities, I see in this picture the question of half a loaf. You're keeping the coal industry going. It's a pretty dirty industry. You're settling for a slower pace of change than simply canceling the fossil energy industries, which some people would love to do. Uh, how do you think about halfway measures in, in life in general? Ambiguity and compromise. And finally, in, the, in, the, in this set of pictures, this one. And we haven't talked much about aesthetics today, if I'm not mistaken. The whole wind story today, well, a very large part of the wind story today is about aesthetics. Off Nantucket, in Nantucket Sound, what was to be a very major U.S. presence in wind with some of the strongest winds in the country off the, in that particular place isn't happening uh, because people say it isn't beautiful. If you climb to the top of a mountain and you're, on the, you're at the ridge and you find a wind turbine, are you upset or do you feel you have company? How do we talk about that? What I can tell you is people don't talk about that. We don't have your help. So it goes, pretty much it remains as, as unresolved conflict. I bet you could help. In all cases, I'm suggesting, I think, I hope, that the fraught solutions can be done better or less well or better. That there, everything can be done less, better or worse. And that actually, a good analogy is the quite ill patient and the doctor considering unproven strong medicines or medicines known to have strong side effects and are they appropriate? And those judgment calls are made every day and most of us by the time they've reached the age of most of you in the room have seen those uh, judgment calls firsthand or to somebody they cared about. Um, and so the, the Hippocratic Oath rewritten for a world more complex than that for which uh, do no harm was sufficient uh, has this wonderful sentence. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. Going back to the Greeks, that's humanism, ambiguity, and a certain sense of uh, the tragic condition that we face. I want to turn to a, one specific new guy on the block, um, which is the idea that we are going to need, in quotes, to take the planet over. Uh, we, we are going to be sufficiently dissatisfied with the way it's going to, things are going to turn out because of our limited capacity to organize programmatic responses to the climate change problem. And we will then um, decide to take the planet as a whole as our engineered system. This specific picture is of a volcano in June of 1991 on the, in the Philippines called Pinatubo. Since that explosion, now it's 21 years, there hasn't been a volcano that large. Going back in time, there, there were many larger ones, including in recorded history. But this one was large enough at a time when our science was developed enough, there were enough instruments that we could document that after it exploded, the Earth got cooled for a year. Exactly how it got cooled, and what happened to plant life, and what happened to hydrology, we know a great deal. And so, it, and the reason was it was so big that particles were, were lofted into the stratosphere, which is the upper atmosphere, which, which is where things are quite quiescent. It's called stratosphere because it's in, in strata as opposed to the troposphere where things are turbulent, which is the lower atmosphere. And up there, things stay for a few years. Particles stay for a few years, and they finally fall out. And so because, and a typical volcano, if their particles lofted up, they'll fall down in a few weeks, and there won't be a climate signal for a year or two. Um, and so we know that if we put particles in the stratosphere, the planet will get cooler. And we know how to put particles in the stratosphere on purpose, although we haven't done it. We sort of think we know how to do it with either balloons or rockets or planes. And um, 
So people are seriously talking and philosophers are engaged in a very interesting way. It is a good, it is a good examination, in fact, of the collaboration of humanities and, and the technology crowd. What's at stake here? And how do we do it? Political scientists are involved. How do we organize it? And, and, but then comes the question that I'm finding not attended to, and I'm going to try to see if I can get you interested in it. Suppose it works. And we have something which we could call Earth enhancement. Um, and the analogy, which is also being played out in a multidisciplinary conversation today, is about genetic engineering and human being enhancement. Human being enhancement, and there's a colleague of, of mine, Lee Silver, who's written about this in a book called Remember, something Eden. What's the word before Eden? For somebody will know. Um, about human enhancement, how determined parents are going to be to make their children special, taller, more beautiful, smarter. And there's an analogy here to what we would do if we have this capability, one can suppose, which is in particular going to make the rough places plain. Um, do we want to see that happen? What is lost? And a guy named Michael Sandel, who many of you know, a professor teaching famous justice course at Harvard, took on the genetic side of this. Not, I've tried to talk him into taking on the, ge the geological, the earth scale side, but he hasn't done that. But he wrote in, I think, the, behavior, the, the Bio Bioethics Commission of the government about 10 years ago. He wrote this book, which essentially was his testimony the case against perfection. And he noted the number of ways in which the search for perfection goes awry in eugenics, in steroids and sports, which we've seen plenty of, in hyperparenting, I like that word. And he says, and I'll just read this, that an, or, and, and the enhancement can be pursued to excess. And he tries to articulate what is lost. Um, and, the, and he talks about the loss of the, the loss of randomness and the and the and the, the unbidden. I think that may be his own word. And I think something's at stake in geoengineering also uh, that we aren't talking about at all. I cannot find a resonance in the non-humanist communities to which this where this is discussed to this set of questions. Do we actually want to have the most perfect world we could achieve? by some definition of perfect that is uh, very much bad in terms of convenience and, and minimum disruption. So, sort of wrapping up, uh, I started with student, with the things I showed it in, in slides to students. This is something students showed to me. I asked them to comment on something, actually something I'd written and I collected some other things the students wrote, and it's another theme that was mentioned a couple of times today about democracy and environmental change. One student wrote, without affectation, at what point is it necessary just to implement policy irrespective of what the general public thinks? When do we say enough is enough? Another student, completely uncorrelated, didn't see the other ones writing and decide that all mitigation techniques have failed, leaving us with no choice but to try geoengineering technologies, even if these risks are unknown. And how much time do we have left? Get back to the third, but the first two are scary. Princeton undergraduates, creme de la creme, who haven't asked themselves the, about the limits of expertise, and who decides They've grown up somehow in America, were able to write a sentence like that at age 19 because of their way, own sense of privilege. I'm reading stuff in. I don't know the kids. I've met them, but I don't know what that's what's driving them. And the last one is fascinating, too. It was really on a different topic, but it's related. Is there such a thing as running out of time? I actually don't think there is. I can't imagine that the, those students at 40 
uh, will not have choices ahead of them that make a difference, for better or for worse. And I challenged them, and I challenged, I think this is something we have to challenge ourselves. Could it be that we could run out of time? What that, would that mean? We don't discuss time very much, particularly future time. So my message is, please work with us, at least sometimes. I was hoping and delighted, hoping that Mary would say, Mary Evelyn would say what she did, and then she did, and she looked at me when she said it, um, that of answering Tom Barron's question, what's your favorite myth? That modern science is an unbelievably exciting myth, just so full of texture and complexity, um, and answering questions we never dreamed we could answer. In my grown-up years, well, start in my, in my, in my lifetime, we have figured out cosmology to a substantial extent. In the, when I was a college student, the Big Bang Theory was in rivalry with com continuous creation that Fred Hoyle was presenting. And it was sorted out with the discovery of microradi background radiation, for sure, uh, just a few years later. DNA, my college years. Seafloor spreading, this building, approximately my college years, and formation of continents. In so many domains, past time has become rigorous in my lifetime. Future time, <coughs> sorting out differentially obligations over a 10-year period, a 50-year period, a 100-year period, 500 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, sorting out time into the future in a rigorous fashion is completely un... It's a project we've hardly articulated. Mary Evelyn and, and John, actually not Mary Evelyn, John's book, Mary Evelyn's book with her co-author, uh, puts the phrase, a compulsion to control, which I think we could associate with the geoengineering story of a few minutes ago. What is needed to, this is her quote, what is needed in courage, what is needed is courage, to live in the midst of the ambiguities of this moment without drawing back into fear and a compulsion to control. That sentence is on a sentence with the Hippocratic Oath, um, the compulsion to control. We have to, you guys really can help that. And I've mentioned a few times, shorthand, the moving finger, uh, fateful choices, path dependency, a whole set of issues that scientists and engineers just aren't very good at. And the destiny issue is what I've just been talking about. It's interesting, the, the concept of the local man, I, the last man. I had not heard the thought of the last man before today. But there's another question that's closely related to the last man. It's way out there in the future. Or is it? So I, heard that, I heard it. I was deeply stirred at a dinner that um, I went to with, organized by, Bert, by, by um, Peter Singer. Too many singers, Mom. Peter Singer. With a utilitarian young philosopher guest who was, and she was working on, the, on the question of whether it mattered if there was an end to the human experiment in a, such a way that no one was suffering. We just, we just had our, the last person was happy, personally happy. No, in the, on, a util, on a util index that were only positive numbers. But it was all over at a certain time. And it was, it's actually hard, apparently, for utilitarians to get to a point where they feel something is lost in that story. And it seemed absolutely horrible to me that there could be such a, such a, a, a system in which you could not feel that that was one of the worst things that could possibly happen. But it meant that we have to discuss together whether it is one of the worst things that could possibly happen. What is it that we are here to do in a multi-generational sense. Part of my answer is very close to Mary, Mary Evelyn's and John's. So we're here to discover who we are and to tell the story of science, which is not complete by a long shot right now. We have many, many th wonderful things will be discovered. And that somehow we're doing this. We don't know if anyone else is doing it, anywhere else in the universe, but we're doing this. And to bring that to a close is it, sinful. 
So I close with a, this sentence was on the three by five card on the window of my, of the, the door of my own thesis advisor and I loved it ever since I read it then. In order to know the truth, it is necessary to imagine a thousand falsehoods. People say that that is the, it epitomizes the scientific method. It is a method of wonderment, invention, many, many false terms. And it also, I think, with the word imagination, it speaks to the humanities as well. We're in this together. Thank you. sad for the professor because I can't understand why he can't talk about it. I'm looking at Henry in front of, halfway between me and you is Henry Horn, who's been teaching ecology in Princeton about as long as I've been teaching also, and I don't think he or I would have trouble talking about all in the classroom. Nor do I think Steve is a, 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 exceptional, in that particular is exceptional in hundreds of ways, but in feeling, cherishing nature so you could do anything with your life when you're a kid. You think you can do anything when you choose to be a scientist. It's, it's a very large part of that is because you actually want to be in nature, which you cherish. So one of the, I'll just say something else, the results applies to this building again. I'm privileged to have moved in this building from the engineering school. Nobody stopped me and I decided to do it. And this is where so much marvelous ecology and geoscience has, has happened over more than a century. When I came to Princeton, which is 1971, there was an, eco, there was an ecology de, department or a unit, uh, and it was dealing with graduate admissions, and I would get student applications that I thought should be looked at by the ecologists. They would get applications they thought I should look at. So there's, there's this period in January where folders are carried from one place to another. And they were not accepting ecology graduate students who had a whiff of wanting to change the world. They preferred to take the science students who were going to be leaders in the science community. I remember the argument, our job is to train the leaders of the major, the major institutions in ecology for the next generation. And it flipped. Henry, you may want to, add, you want to maybe revise my story, but this is how I, I saw it. And the main thing that made it flip was that they were dedicated typically to very particular places, John Turborg to the eastern side of the Andes in Peru, which were being, which had started out pristine. 
and which were all feeling the effects of the human intrusion. And they themselves realized that their problem was far more multidisciplinary and action-oriented than they had seen it previously. And it was their love for where they had been working and their sense that it was all changing in front of them and the whole paradigm of working in that, studying nature in the absence of human impact was disappearing in front of them that made them feel re revisit their field at a top place like this. I saw this happen to a particular individual, one of the most famous members of this department over the years, Bob May, who now it was then the chief scientist, the head of the Royal Society and is, lives, in, lives in Oxford right now. Um, and so cherishing is a very important part of what we have in common. Bob, do you, uh, Henry, do you agree? Well, yes. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, I apologize in advance for, uh, for the question that I'm about to ask because I'm going to be difficult on purpose. Because you can be difficult on purpose. Be difficult. No, don't, don't apologize. Argumentative. Um, and I want to say before I do that that I'm totally for the utopian project of collaboration between humanities and scientists. And as a humanist who used to work at MIT, um, one of the things that I want to ask, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, I want to put the whole room on the spot, right, is given that there is a pervasive sense in, especially in engineering and physics, right, that even biology, right, is not really a science because it's not mathematically correct enough, right, it's not. It's not rigorous enough mathematically. And by the way, do you watch um, The Big Bang Theory, the show? I haven't. I know it's there, but I haven't There's watched it. There's a physicist who argues with his neurologist girlfriend about the fact that her science is not really a science. So anyway, given that, right, then the humanities are sort of all the way down on the scale of rigor if physics is your idea of what real knowledge is. So, so given this problem, of the hierarchy of knowledges in the academy, what are we going to do about that? Right? In other words, because the problem with humanists collaborating with scientists is that we can't be the handmaid of scientists. Right? Like we have to be peers when we collaborate. I'm going to let other people answer it because it, I think that worldview is out of date, but I may be kidding myself. Badly out of date. No, I agree that it's out of date, but being out of date is different than being out of power. Out of power. So, Mary, uh, uh, okay. Let's have others discuss the, the, that. The big, the big difference is not so much power as money yeah. and space. And at that level, how are those different in academia? <laughs> they can be made different. Okay. And and it's it's up to both. Humanists and scientists, in their dealings with uh, academic colleagues and in their handling of money and space, to exercise more in the way of humanism than of analysis. I mean, my, I guess I'm trying to formulate it. The more that's at stake, the less you can allow that to be how you look at the world. I can't. I think around issues of nuclear war, around my, my own coming of age around the protests of the Vietnam War. That isn't how it was. It just wasn't. Why don't you introduce uh, I'm, introduce I'm, I'm Mario Diamosones. I'm a professor at the School of Architecture. Uh, I work in what I call urbanism, which is a different story. Uh, now, um, architects have seen that conflict, that tension in their own house forever. Uh, at a certain point, Interesting for me since I came to Princeton, so over 
20 years ago. And but I also, before coming to Princeton, I did the rounds of the other schools, starting with Harvard and MIT and Yale. And from Yale, I came. And uh, so I got this sense of the tensions in every place and the power struggle in every one of those places. And, uh, and the reason I'm here is because the humanities have the upper hand in our school. And we still talk about thesis, that is our graduate students, our undergrads present thesis. But uh, they're definitely not the scientific thesis. Their hypotheses are very far from all the scientific hypotheses. But uh, there's still, I think, a, a borrowing from the sciences, as architecture is being borrowing from everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's basically, uh, we are supposed to know everything, and in the end, we are total amateurs Somehow we managed to convert that into a representation of the culture, of the, the state of the arts, and somehow uh, move it to from the level of the realm of ideas to the physical state of a building or building. So what I'm saying is that I do I do think that uh, there is possibility for negotiation, for the consensus. And, but I, I also feel that the mutual of the attention, the cohabitation, is really important. I'm saying I grew up with that. And I am, you know, since I'm here, I've been pushing the school in that direction, and that's the reason I'm the lonely architect here, because I still think that one day we'll be able to bring what PEI is doing to architecture, but hopefully I'll also bring the art to PEI. And in the end, we're not only providing the art, but also the major source of all the problems that PEI is supposed to be. That is, we build the world, and the major source of all the problems are starting. People are hungry? I should add, I would put my own two cents in the figure graphic itself. Uh, my time here at PEI, this would be your question, like, really worries me because you know, uh, Gene is so interested in environmental humanities and has to. And having been around other places, I won't malign what it was in the war crowd. But it is the case that, you know, that divide you're talking about is alive and well. And, and I don't know, did anyone know exactly how to? The people are trying. I mean, I mean the, the very fact that Rob is here and has been so receptive, and Steve Piccala and Bard, I mean, there's a real effort here to try to work it out. Um, it's an interesting time, an interesting time where it's a good place to be because people are trying to work it out. But, um, and, and it's not just as sort of, you know, uh, a, a sort of a second partner or, or, you know, in English, us being communicators for them. I mean, it's a real effort to, to incorporate this into it. I'm optimistic, but I agree with you. It's, it's confusing and it's still very much in the flow. If it's an uphill battle, please fight it, because we will do terrible things on this planet dealing with the fact that we can't really fit if we don't have the humanities making just intense, frequent contributions that trump the ones the scientists come up with. So, so Rob raised a number of uh, Brilliantly provocative issues, and um, and it sort of began with provocation into the humanist sort of jumping pool, and it's and, and in some way I want to kind of go back to that part, but in the context of, uh, of of this comment, but I also want to sort of try to depersonalize some of these issues in some ways and more sociologize them because you know it's. You know, it's very easy. I mean, you, you know, you sort of meet your friendly humanist or your friendly scientist, and you know, and they're cool and you're buds, and you can do stuff together, and you know, and, and they sort of defective the evil empire, which is 
just on the other side of the divide. But I mean, but I think it's important to actually think about these these systems of education and knowledge production in much more sociological terms. And I don't have the full explanations, and I'm not going to go on forever. But I'll just I'll just kind of do a little bit of a sketch here. I mean, most of the great successes in interdisciplinary have actually been in science side and not on the humanities side. I mean, you have the, the you have the emergence of fields like biochemistry. It's very difficult to think of, of analogs of that in the, in the humanities. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, one reason has to do with some of the sciences are at least because of the need for money, tend to be driven more by kind of macro trends. So NSF, other funding agencies can do things to bring collaboration together that you don't really have the analogs of on the science side. Um, you also have in quantitative disciplines, you at least have some common form of expression. In qualitative disciplines, you often have people who have different words that feed different concepts will apply to the depth about, about which one of them you use, even though it can be very difficult to be explicit about what is at stake. And I think partially, one of the things that emerges from this C is that for many humanities fields, disciplinary identity and even subdisciplinary identity have become very, very important. And in some cases, you know, I mean, anthropology is in some ways the classic case of that that we don't need to talk about in, in detail. So the, the main point that I want to make, you know, is part of the problem is bridging this gap between the sciences and the humanities. But another big part of the problem is that the humanities themselves have not organized themselves in a way that, that makes it very easy for people to extend a hand across this gap. And a lot of the reason for this isn't because people are bad people or arrogant people or contemptuous people, but because of a whole bunch of institutional and sociological facts about where these fields of knowledge set in larger institutional context. And so, in, and so when we get to this point in the discussion, I would just like to see somebody somewhere do more thinking about how to reorganize and to think differently about these institutions and less about who our favorite humanist friends are, or scientist friends, or who I love or who is me, which is sort of how these institutions kind of resolve. So that's like one twelfth of a rant. Well, I, 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 I frankly am a little confused, though, that this is where the talk has taken you. Even if you have a small office and share a secretary with five other professors and don't have a summer salary, and your field is horribly balkanized and, is, and, you, have to, and you have to publish in something that almost nobody else reads in the, in the, down the hall, even if all that is true, what's stopping you from working on whether, um, whether dread uh, is legitimate or whether, wind, whether in, uh, manufactured intrusions on the landscape are pretty or awful, or some of the other things that I said. But, just, well, just do it. Well, but look, I mean, the obvious answer to that is nothing stops me. Um, but if you look at the incentive structures and the institutional structures by which careers generally are made over populations, my point is there are many barriers for of course there are. humanities and in some of the social sciences. And in many respects, the barriers are fewer for at least some people in some of the sciences, or at least different. That's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. We shouldn't think that people over populations are sort of, you know, Kantian agents no. who just have no. enough goodwill, you know, can sort of plunge ahead of and, and, and form a life. What it's worth, there's not a chance I would have been in Princeton except that I, I bucked barriers. That was all that people could see that was worthwhile. So I'll just, um, I'll just speak from my own um, experience, and I won't be speaking about my own institution, just my own experience, because of course we never want to talk about our own institution, right? Um, in my experience, um, as a person who works on both sides of the house uh, in the humanities and also
hard questions are perceived to be maybe negative or something. And um, and and we, we do ask hard questions. And, and sometimes, I don't know, this might, may just be my own personal experience, that there's a, a sort of divide between uh, understanding of what it is that humanists think of themselves as doing and and just art, you know, art that you look at or a dance that you go to or, 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 or a play that you go to. So that's just a comment. And now a bunch of hands in the back, right? Go to fun. You know, in some ways, we should Maybe this is so important, bro. Maybe we shouldn't even be done here. You see, because I think it's something that generates a lot of uh, feeling and interest and discussion, and obviously will extend beyond this. But and you are a provocateur. But to pick up on, on Dale and Tony's point, um, I think what we what we have to acknowledge is uh, empirical knowing and symbolic knowing. You know, these are these are completely different ways of knowing and valuing knowledge. And so, I mean, you refer to it as quantitative and qualitative, uh, Dale, but um, you know, symbolic knowing is like off the charts for uh, being valued in academia, even though it's explosive in the world of, of media and so on and so forth. But I really think it's a, it's a sense of how we value knowledge, and and that of course means it's funded and so on, but. The, the knowledge of humanities, be it historical or symbolic and so on, is simply on the periphery of what people think is real, is going to be taken seriously to be measured and so on. You have a formidable competitor in science, and the word you didn't use, science is cumulative. Yeah. So, so when you're investing in something, it's even if it's a very small brick, that building is getting bigger, not necessarily better, but bigger. And uh, there is an error correction mechanism. And there, is a, there is a method of learning, which is ast astoundingly productive. And so I don't see your saying, well, we have an alternative edifice that's going to compete with yours. But you're, you're in the building, too. It's just humanities are fluff. That's the point. In, in academia, they're kind of considered fluff instead of asking, you know, hard a, questions. Yeah. And yeah. I love your challenge back to us. Post tenure, most people do have an opportunity to do something creative unless they Thank just you. are careerists, you know, and want to keep publishing. So I, I think your challenge still remains, but the sense of moving beyond fluff to something to really contribute, uh, we're not there yet. Yeah, it's a, fluff doesn't seem right. The right word for me, but it's how you see yourselves, and that's that's meaningful. That's meaningful. But if you're constructing, the, if science is this edifice that's being built in by these amazing ways, the scientific method back to Francis Bacon or wherever, it's, it's so productive. What's the role of the humanist in that building? You're in the building. You're not outside, and you're not. I don't know what how you get fluff into the building in the first place, but um, what are the roles you can play? Conversation of the social sciences, with that funny combination of words that define that they use to define themselves. Um, 
because they are deciding whether to allow a given building to be torn, uh, remain and be re-inhabited in some place in, north, in northern Hokkaido, or to um, hunch you, rather, or to um, tear it down because of a certain background radiation and how where that line should be drawn. Scientists can't draw the line. So they're exercising judgment. And if, we, if they were, are we just forgetting that they are, are they a bridge? They are, are there are the problems they are purporting to solve and, and willy-nilly determining the answers to? Ones which we're actually both feeding into, we just haven't paid attention to that today. I really wonder because one real problem after another, do we, do we cite that windmill off Nantucket? How seriously do we take the um, uh, uh, James Taylor's perspective on it? Who's, or one of the other people living in, that, in Martha's Vineyard who don't want to see this thing when they sail their boats. Uh, should, should they trump? Shouldn't they trump? They, at the end of the day, they either do or they don't. And probably we're all informing that decision without even realizing that we're actually both, all doing it. We are at. Uh, sure. I just think we leave that question. I think. Yes, let's, let's end on that.